uh, let's begin. Well, welcome to the uh, April 10th Legislative Matters Sub or Committee of the Northampton City Council. Um, Bara, could you take a roll, please? Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Um, Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. And Councillor Nash. Here. All right, we, uh, everyone participating on Zoom today will be audio and video recorded. And uh, in this committee, you're welcome to use first names. So if you prefer full titles are also fine. And um, please turn off your camera if you aren't speaking. It's, it's hard to see members of the committee and others who are recognized uh, if we have too many screen, too many videos on at one time. Um, so next is public comment. So this is public comment for items that aren't on the agenda. If you're here to comment for the public hearing um, on reduced lot line uses allowed by right or um, on the two ordinances related to parking, then please wait until that item comes up in the agenda. Um, but if you <clears throat> would like to comment on items that aren't on the agenda, uh, please keep your comments to three minutes and um, raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, you can use star nine, or you can also raise your physical hand and turn on your video if those uh, if other are options aren't working. Um, and you can use chat just to deal with technical problems. How's your day? And um, you can send that to me or to Laura Kretzler. <clears throat> so, uh, and if it, folks could mute, if you right are as you, um, not uh, so we're back right as the wind Berg sign oh, goes, it was like, like that's to see. So, um, yeah, Laura, would you be able to mute folks that aren't? Yes, I think I just muted. Yeah, great, thank you. <clears throat> um, so Nan S, it has their hand raised. Nan, if you could state your name and your city or town. Uh, Nancy Smith, uh, Chapel Street, Northampton. Today, I'd like to ask the question, when is the right time to discuss and act on ordinance and zoning changes intended to help provide more affordable housing, but which instead have been abused by builders for profit, exacerbating the housing crisis, not helping to alleviate it? Yes, we are a capitalist country, builders are capitalists, and I'm, I am too, but capitalism depends on guardrails to keep it from going off the rails. We need our city government to step up and put those guardrails back in place. We are counting on you. On the advice of a great local activist, I watched the April 26, 2021 community resource meeting where some zoning ordinance changes were being discussed and the corresponding May 10th, 2021 joint meeting of legislative matters and city council where they were voted upon. As you've seen so many times, people poured their hearts out trying desperately to save their middle and lower income neighborhoods and life sustaining tree cover. Council is asking great questions and showing real concern, but in the end, they voted to pass the ordinances despite the concerns because they and we the people are told. We do hear you, but that's not what we are voting on tonight. We can only vote on what's before us according to the law, so now is not the time to address your concerns, but we do hear you. Builders accuse residents, residents accuse builders, but the truth is far too many guardrails have been removed. I am looking to you, our guardians of the guardrails, to set the time and date to address our real concerns that you have heard and seen for yourselves many times. We want to help. We'll be there with ideas like make the builder uh, abuse changes applicable only to 40B housing and nonprofit housing like Habitat for Humanity. Have builders go back to getting permits and reviews. Let neighborhoods be involved in the process. So ideas like Mr. Ryan's alternate build plan for, for Bay State development that would have made the builder a lot of money, been better for the neighborhood and save the trees, might have had a shot. City Council arranged meetings with builders like the Laurel Street Affordable Housing Meetings, brought great results, and uncovered water issues the city and builder were not aware of, so they could be addressed before things went horribly wrong. NCDs could be a similar answer. Neighborhoods and people are not the enemy. We, like you, are the city. Mr. Ryan's example, which was very good, was dismissed as invalid because it was not a reviewed plan. No, it wasn't. It was an example a concerned, knowledgeable citizen took a great deal of his personal time to illustrate. 
That is not a hear you. That is I dismiss and disrespect you. Just as builders and planners, planners are knowledgeable about their fields, so are neighbors knowledgeable about their neighborhoods. We need to drop the disrespect and anger over the past and learn to work together. Those much needed guardrails will help. And this is a top down thing. This has to come from the top where we need to work together and it needs to be supported that way. Probably the best question I heard in those meetings was very simple. Couldn't these ordinance changes be abused for profit? The answer was long and confusing. The follow-up question repeated the question. Couldn't these ordinance changes be abused for profit? A slightly shorter reply to the follow-up did finally end in, yes, but that's not what we are going after. We don't anticipate that happening. With the benefit of two years of experience since that vote, the answer is an absolute yes. They can be and have been abused. So again, I turn to our guardians and the guardians two years later and ask, when is the time to address our valid concerns and issues with these ordinance and zoning changes? We are counting you on and see if, if you could finish your sentence. Yep. Um, the time should be now. Um, I, 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 can I do two? I'm almost done. Um, sure. how, how, how about we reject all ordinance changes until we have time to address these issues? None of this is meant, and this is important, none of this is meant to be disrespectful. I can't imagine how or why you do these jobs. We don't pay you well, but we do need your help uh, and action on this. So thank you very much for your time and all you do, and thank you for the extra time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Nancy. Next is Claudia Lefko. Hi, this wasn't planned, but I'm just gonna follow up a bit on what Nancy was saying. Um, I went to the meeting a few weeks ago, uh, a joint, uh, some special committee about why citizens aren't participating. They're not joining boards, there are all these vacancies and they're not actively participating. 11 people were on this call. Half of them, I think at least, were members of this committee or the commission. And I told a story I've told before about how I went to a meeting, a man came all the way to the meeting to tell us he wasn't going to join because he couldn't deal with the city anymore. He tried and he was giving up. So last week I went to meet with an environmentalist who lives in town. I wanted to talk to them about the issues that are occurring on Montview that I'm concerned about. The person who's an expert in their field said to me, I'm not participating anymore in these discussions in the city since they cut down the cherry trees on Warfield Place. So I'm just kind of going to echo what Nancy Nan just said. Oh, I hardly know Nan, but we happen to be of the same field here. Um, about the need for people to be taken seriously. I mean, we've been accused of having whims, that the neighborhood has whims about development rather than we have opinions and so forth. But I think until, it's about really democracy. I mean, if we actually want something in the city to work, if we want the city to work, I think we have to have a way where citizens actually feel they're being taken seriously. So that's my statement and thanks. I'm just curious, Alex, does anybody ever make trouble on Zoom and you need to shut them off? But just a comment, just a question. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. And your city or town? Uh, Northampton, 40 Valley Street, Northampton. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Next is Jacqueline. Hi, yes, good evening, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, and Jacqueline, could you say your name and city or town? Yes, Jacqueline McCraner, uh, Ward 3, Northampton. Um, so I'm just going to piggyback with uh, what Nan said and what Claudia said that um, residents are really concerned about uh, the development in our neighborhoods, and we would really love the opportunity to work respectfully with um, Director Mish and with city councilors. Uh, we are aware that the Barrett Planning Group is going to be pitching their new uh, revised uh, historic preservation plan sometime this spring at a not too long ago historical commission meeting which happened i think in february early february that commission said that the barrett planning group had um, suggested strongly recommended that the uh, historical commission and the planning board meet jointly to discuss uh, 
issues, including historic preservation and workforce housing issues, uh, sustainable housing issues and things of that nature. So I really hope that both the planning board and the historical commission do have that joint meeting. Um, also, Director Mish had said no to having um, our group coordinate with uh, Eric Hill of the Cambridge Historical Commission to present on neighborhood conservation districts to both the Historical Commission and the Committee on Community Resources um, before the Barrett Planning Group unveils their new preservation plan. Um, so residents would still very much like to have this meeting happen. And um, we think that, um, you know, we wouldn't even be necessarily pursuing the idea of neighborhood conservation districts, if the doesn't fit principle were upheld, um, if the um, idea of infill design standards was upheld and in the sustainable uh, plan, the uh, sustainable Northampton plan, it states that there would be a mechanism for residents to work with developers um, and city officials regarding the development of their neighborhoods. And that just hasn't happened. So. There's, um, there's real concern among Northampton residents that our voices are not being heard and uh, that the city is just plowing forward with infill and other construction that um, leads to affordability issues throughout our city regarding the housing sector, leads to social justice issues, sustainability issues, infrastructure issues, and climate related uh, goals and issues. So thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Is there anyone else who has general public comment? Not related to items on the agenda. Oops. Um, seeing none, we'll move on to approval of minutes of the previous meeting. We have the minutes of January 9th, 2023 uh, up, up for us. And uh, we'll look for a motion to approve this. Move for approval. Second. Motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Jim Nash. Any discussion on approval? Jim. Laura does a really good job and I really oh. appreciate it. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> Seeing no further, uh, Laura, roll call please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. Brings us to the public hearing on the proposed zoning change. Uh, so this was referred to us and the planning board on February 16th. The public hearing notice was published March 27th and April 3rd in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And um, do you, did we have a positive recommendation from the planning board? Is that correct? I believe so, right, Carolyn? I, I may have. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. great, good to know. Um, and um, so now we are going to have a public hearing on the topic. And um, reminder that during a public hearing, it's, this is, it's our opportunity to hear from the public and from city staff and to also to ask questions of city staff. And once uh, we close the hearing, that's when we'll deliberate on a recommendation. So I look for a motion to open the public hearing. So move. Second. Motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Marissa Elkins. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Oh, you're muted, Clara. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And I should say that is uh, to, that motion was to open the public hearing on 23.247, an ordinance to clarify reduced lot line uses allowed by right. So the public hearing is now open. And at first, I'd like to hear from proponents, including uh, Director Carolyn Mish from the planning department. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you all. Um, it's good to be here. 
the ordinance amendment before you is a little bit of a, a cleanup. So a couple of years ago, there were there was a request by um, residents uh, to modify what was then called zero lot line development and um, to make it clear understanding of what it means to have sort of a reduced lot line and set up new parameters and new design configurations for reduced lot line. Mm -hmm. And through that conversation, there was a concern that um, this remained um, available only for um, single family homes. And so that was carried forward. It was always a single family home provision, actually even going back when it was previously referred to as zero lot line. However, under uh, zero lot line developments in single family homes, single family homes always also included the allowance for an accessory dwelling unit. So that effectively, if you availed yourself of this sort of reduced side setback line, and that's what we're talking about when you have a bigger property and you divide it into um, two properties, for example, with um, the minimum frontage required, that you could have a reduced um, side setback between those two new parcel boundaries. And it was a provision for single family homes, but at the time, the definition of single family home also included an accessory dwelling. But when we made these changes to reduce lot line, it wasn't clear that, um, so in the, about the same time period, we also changed the definition of accessory dwelling and just now refer, it to, uh, refer to it as two family because we got rid of some of the, um, um, uh, restrictions around that second unit by allowing people more flexibility to have larger units and take away the home ownership requirement of the property. So now we don't refer to an accessory dwelling unit per se. It's still part of the mix that you can sort of create as a second unit on a property. But the two in combination then means that Previously, when you could do a reduced lot line with an accessory dwelling, now you really can't. And so this would reintroduce that ability um, as long as it's under one roof. Um, because there was a concern during that conversation that you all heard um, from folks that um, it would be important to ensure that it that this reduced lot line didn't allow additional structures to be added to properties along that same reduced um, setback line going to the rear. So if we feel like um, this provision to reintroduce the ability to have two units in a structure as long as it's under a single roof, um, is consistent with the way the ordinance had always been for 25, 30 years as accessory dwelling um, when we had um, zero lot line. And it addresses that concern of developing detached second units beyond in the, in the rear yards. And again, this is only applicable in the urban residential B and C districts. And so that's the, that's the basic um, premise behind this um, amendment. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, are there any uh, questions from committee members? All right, then we'll open it up to the public and there certainly will be an opportunity for questions um, later as well. And um, so um, are there, <clears throat> Let's see, so please raise your virtual hand. And as before, if you have trouble, uh, you can let me or Laura know. Uh, so first up is Jack, oh, and please uh, keep your comments to three minutes if you can. Um, prob we'll probably have enough time to have additional comments after as well if necessary. Um, First up is Jackie Balance. Jackie, if you could state your uh, name and, and city or town. Yeah, Jackie Balance from Florence. And I would like to um, screen share, please. I have. Yes, you have that ability. Oh, good. I have um, do, 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 some pictures to show you that demonstrate real life consequences 
of zero lot line development by right. Okay, here we go. When Northampton voted for infill, it was sold to voters as flexibility for homeowners to build accessory dwelling units on their properties, like this one in Florence and to concentrate new commercial housing developments close to business and to areas where people could walk to work and do their shopping. Hinkley Terrace is a lovely development, but like most of Bay State, it's not really in walking distance to very much. In the past couple of years, hot spots have popped up across the city because of the limitations of our infill ordinances. We've seen some wildly unexpected outcomes that have affected neighborhood integrity and character. This value was taken for granted by many residents until we saw our homes and our streets threatened with undesirable infill. Zero and reduced lot line ordinances, along with a 50 foot frontage allowance have permitted speculative developers to build these so-called luxury colonial houses in a neighborhood that's been working class since it grew up around the mills in the 1800s. Now it's seeing gentrification on steroids. A quick word about the history of zero lot lines. When the history created the zoning category called cluster development, Groups of houses were allowed to be built close together in mm -hmm. clusters with zero lot line setbacks. Putting houses so close was a trade-off because a specific amount of actual acreage was required to be set aside as green space. Then at some point, zero lot lines were allowed across the board by right without any review, without any green space preservation required, disregarding the original intent of reducing lot line setbacks, the preservation of precious green space. By right, zero lot line ordinances gave commercial developers a tool to get many more houses on much less land without using the guidance of our doesn't fit provisions with a combination of reducing the footage requirement to only 50 feet, houses of even average square footage are too wide in proportion to the lot, especially when they are massed together. They look like fortresses. The combination of zero or reduced lot line development by right on 50 foot frontage lots happened six times in a single year on the block where I live. I'd like to keep, to keep it from happening to others. That's just the golden rule. Now, this reduced lot line condo building in Montview looks like a cross between a jail and a nursing home. It conjures up a place of unwilling confinement and it's in harsh contrast to the historic legacy of this neighborhood that goes back just about to the time of the original English settlers. While a neighborhood's character is subjective, it is also very real. When Carolyn Mish once spoke about what she called the alley effect, she explained, and I quote, it's really meant to describe the proximity of two structures together and what it is, that dimension that feels right. Now that dimension that feels right means what your average reasonable person might call harmonious proportions. It's illustrated in the amendments to the zoning code shown here that I refer to as the doesn't fit provisions. I will mention there is one desirable result of unwelcome infill, and that has been the new historic preservation efforts underway in Bay State and in Montview. We didn't know the value of what we took for granted, our sense of neighborhood history and community, until we started losing it. As Joni Mitchell warned us, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Reduced lot lines have unleashed infill with other consequences that voters never anticipated. 
I refer to the rapid loss of mature trees representing thousands of years of carbon sequestration that were planted more than a century ago, often to define property lines. They have been sacrificed to zero reduced lot line development by right. And in the face of a climate crisis, the loss of these trees is a crime against nature, a crime against life itself. I'm asking the committee to vote no on expanding the reduced lot line construction of the two family houses by right. Two families will be even bigger than the single families we've seen. The ancient Greeks understood. The Jackie, importance of do you have, has your presentation much, much longer? The value of it's almost over. And public okay. spaces. Please protect Northampton from the structures which are so out of proportion, structures that don't fit in our historic neighborhoods. And I'll say that all of our urban neighborhoods are historic. And please protect what's left of our life-giving trees. I've heard folks in my neighborhood and from City Hall saying that it's time for a wide open community discussion, including all the concerned residents to review how infill has succeeded and where it's failed and what direction residents want to see it take going forward. Look, our residents influence the issues that affect our home, homes which in most cases represent the repository of our families saving our wealth as well as thank you Jackie okay thanks thank you again Jackie for that um next is I just I just want to add one thing to what um Councillor Nash said Laura posts the best minutes on the city's website. Thank you. Next is Jacqueline. Jacqueline, your, your name and city or town? Great. Hi, thanks, Alex. My name is Jacqueline McCraner. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. Reduced lot line and uses by right zoning prioritizes developers and property tax generation while sacrificing affordability, social justice in the housing sector in Northampton as well as neighborhood character, charm, history and integrity, historic preservation, sustainability and climate related issues and goals. Regarding affordability and social justice, this amendment prioritizes developers above residents and would contribute to the luxury housing market, thereby contributing to issues regarding redlining, affordability, attainable housing, workforce housing and the obstruction of social justice in the housing sector. Reduced lot line and uses by right are also in direct conflict with preserving neighborhood character and integrity, and this zoning is in direct conflict with sustainability and climate related goals. Reduced lot line and uses by right ensure the continued decimation of healthy mature trees between the ages of 35 and 200 years old, which are our saviors due to their optimal carbon sequestration, oxygen production, cooling benefits, flood reduction benefits, and wildlife habitat benefits. We cannot afford to lose the lungs of Northampton. Forest experts have made it clear that we cannot plant our way out of the climate crisis. We have lost more than 200 acres of forested land to construction and development in Northampton in recent years. Trees are being cut down at an alarming rate due to reduced lot line and uses by right. Sometimes their trunks are left to stand a few feet tall while their crowns are cut off to prevent shading of new solar installations. Applying reduced lot line and uses by right construction to two families would ensure further significant destruction of our tree canopy, which we cannot afford to lose. Healthy mature trees are critical to the survival of the human race. Each healthy mature tree counts and takes decades to grow. Solar panels need to be installed on roofs of existing buildings where the ground has already been disturbed rather than cutting down fresh swaths of healthy mature trees which we need for the survival of our own race and that of plants and animals. This amendment would also lead to the elimination of essential open space and its associated soil related carbon sequestration, overburdening of existing traffic, parking, sewer and stormwater management infrastructure, demolition of existing affordable and attainable housing, 
construction of oversized buildings that are dependent on fossil fuel, thereby creating new individual heat islands and a general increase in Northampton's overall heat island effect. And this amendment would result in the creation of additional expensive luxury housing in Northampton, which excludes people of more modest means. Passing this zoning amendment is akin to putting the cart before the horse. First, we need to ensure that new construction is free of fossil fuel HVAC systems. We need to add measurable greenhouse gas emission reduction goals to our climate action plan, and we need a commitment from the city council and the planning department to protect our existing inventory of attainable workforce housing and to prioritize the construction of new attainable workforce housing to prevent redlining and social injustice in our housing sector. Our city is already dangerously behind the curve regarding sufficient planning for climate change. Uh, this is due to the planning department's refusal to acknowledge the severity of the climate crisis, as well as its head in the sand business as usual attitude regarding zoning, construction and development across the city. Uses by right and reduced lot line zoning are at the heart of the problem. I just have a couple more paragraphs here. Expanding this residential zoning provision at this time is the worst decision that city councilors could make on behalf of Northampton and its residents. On the other hand, it's the best thing to do for promoting social injustice in our housing sector, prioritizing developers and demonstrating apathy toward the climate crisis and its consequences. I don't mean to sound sensational, but I truly believe there will be disastrous consequences for not acting prudently in the face of the climate crisis. Uh, the blind eye that the city and the planning department have been turning to these matters decade after decade, such as promoting zoning that prioritizes developers um, above residents, neighborhoods, trees, and the climate crisis, and the way that it's conducting business as usual construction and development could lead to catastrophic circumstances where we as a municipality will be unable to respond effectively to intensifying climate crises. Um, the, there are very real costs to reduce lot line and uses by right construction and will all suffer if Northampton city officials and staff green light this zoning amendment and continue to build and develop as if we were living in a vacuum. The consequences of the actions that this committee takes this evening will ripple and become magnified in the years to come. You can set us up for success or you can set us up for failure. I respectfully and strongly urge the committee on legislative matters to say no to two family reduced lot line with uses by right construction. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Next is Deborah. Deborah, if you could state your name and city or town. Yeah, hi, my name is Deborah Berkovitz and I live on uh, Warner Street in Florence in Bay State. I haven't prepared any remarks. I'm incredibly impressed with the uh, people who preceded me. I've been silent in these meetings for quite a while in such a state of hopelessness about the inability to be heard uh, by our city leaders. And I've spent time talking with people who are in other towns in Northampton, in, uh, in Massachusetts, and they're stunned by the, the, um, by the direction that Northampton's taking and how different it is from other cities and uh, the wanton disregard for citizens for the environment for wetlands and I just have to ask the question like why rush this and what is so scary about getting real citizen involvement I again and again hear incredibly smart people speaking up at these meetings with no meaningful place to actually affect any change I want to know why the planning director is so afraid of people who live and pay taxes in this city. What is going on here? And, and watching this slippery slope, accessory dwellings are not the same as two families. They had a size limit on them. And I was in those meetings when the change was made to two families. I was there when Alan Verson resigned from the planning board because he tried to get a he tried to get a size limit and he was bulldozed and so here we are like a year whatever later oh whoops sorry you know accessory dwellings are gone we're going to have two families of any size with zero lot lines and i'm here to say on warner street that i spoke up at these meetings about water issues on warner street and about the effects of the properties on the corner of hinkley and warner with the zero lot lines and i was told that each house was being considered individually because it was a zero lot line 
There were three houses put up on a lot and anybody is welcome to come by and see my very uh, costly landscaped front yard that is being eaten away by the unbelievable water running down the, the street because those buildings, there was too much building on one lot. And if anybody would like to go and see what a two family would look like that could be on a zero lot line, I would encourage you to go look at the two family that's being built by New Way Homes on Federal Street, which is enormous relative to the houses next to it, as are many of those developments. And that, that's what we're gonna see. The scale is off and residents are saying the scale is off. It's having a negative effect on us. So why isn't there a mechanism for us to be heard, for us to have the opportunity to have meaningful participation? Most cities would be thrilled to have smart, eloquent, interested, passionate residents participating in these processes. And time and time again, we speak up and we're just ignored. So my question is, what's the rush? What's the push? Because once this goes through, there's no going back. And we just keep seeing this over and over again, and it's like, well, we have this thing, whoops, now we have to correct it. I've heard that before, and maybe I wanna to say to the planning director, like maybe those mistakes shouldn't keep happening, that we have to come back for the corrections afterwards. I don't believe that they're mistakes. I believe it's a very intentional uh, decision to keep rolling out these detrimental changes incrementally. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next is Joyce Rosenfeld. Joyce, your uh, name and city or town, please. Yes, Joyce Rosenfeld. I live in Florence. I live on Warner Street. Um, I haven't been to one of these meetings in a long time. I too, like Deborah, am so impressed with um, the information gathering uh, of my neighbors in their presentations to this and other committees. I, I don't know, uh, I would love to hear a debate among the counselors, the pros and the cons of their thinking. Um, I hardly ever hear that. I hear whether they're going to vote for something or not. Um, so it would be very interesting to me to hear what the councillors are thinking about um, this proposal and by what they're hearing from their constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Tusi. Tusi, your name and city or town? Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. My name is Tusi Gaston Gay, and I live in Florence at 121 Willow Street. And um, I would just like to say that reduced lot line is an invitation to developers to run ripshod over our neighborhoods as they have been doing. And I want to be recorded as being in full agreement with what the two Jackies and Deborah have said, who've spoken much more eloquently than I can tonight. And I also have been to other city meetings where I witnessed very well-spoken residents of Northampton with great research and great experience speaking and having their comments completely ignored. We need more respectful, meaningful citizen input into these crucial decisions. Thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight. Thank you. And next is Diane Scott. Diane, your name and city or town? Hi, Diane Scott. I live at 44 Landy Avenue here in Florence. And um, I'm sorry I came on. I My agenda note didn't say that it was at this time, but um, I have a little statement. I didn't know how much time I would have to share, so I'm just going to read my statement. But Please I'm go asking, ahead. I am asking that the city of Northampton revisit and revoke or revise the current reduced lot lines use uses allowed by right ordinance. I believe that this is being interpreted and used in ways that were never intended when it was put into place, and it is being used to the detriment of our neighborhoods and communities. I have no issue with homeowners adding onto their homes or creating outbuildings that reduce the distance to their neighbors' homes. Just on my little street, we have a home that was built before the reduced line ordinance that we as neighbors were asked to consider, and we did not move to prevent it. We allowed it. It's one of the people that's on this meeting right now. And another neighbor built a little house behind their main house in which an adult child resides. I believe these two instances were entirely in the spirit 
of the ordinance, of the original ordinance. So it cannot be said that I'm against or opposed to infill if it is allowed, if it is to allow a homeowner the opportunity to make changes to their lots that will positively affect their families. I'm completely opposed to this ordinance being exploited by developers to squeeze the utmost, utmost amount of money out of projects that do not improve, fit the character, or benefit those that currently live in our community. I beseech this board and all city boards that have any hand in, hand in the wielding of this ordinance in the way that it has been to reconsider the damage that it has and will do to our beloved neighborhoods. And I feel like as we get closer and closer to the building that's gonna take place across the street, we need to become more and more desperate about the way that we um, ask that it be thoughtful and um, really take into account the neighborhoods that it fits. We have a committee or board in our city that's called community preservation. And I'd like to see some preservation of our community being a part of the conversation when uh, building projects are approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would there anyone else from the public like to comment? Uh, count, uh, so, Director Mish, Carolyn, uh, would you like to um, speak to any of the concerns that were raised in, in public comment? Um, I, you know, there were a couple of examples raised by, um, or brought on the screen from, um, you know, Jackie Balance's presentation about how the buildings didn't fit because they were too close together, which is exactly why the, res the reduced lot line modifications were introduced because of the comments and the concerns create, you know, um, generated from that project. And um, so the new reduced lot line does um, set parameters for, you know, being either exactly um, abutting structures that can be built and you can draw a property line down um, the um, shared party wall, or you need to be at least, you know, um, 10 feet less than the, the um, adding up those two setbacks. So that was really in response to concerns raised about um, making sure that there's um, continues to be sort of the rhythm in the, in the neighborhoods that might be typical of these neighborhoods. Um, so I wanted to, to point that out, that this was changed in response to that. Um, and, you know, when there are two family, um, new two family units proposed, that does, and it's more than a 2000 square foot um, construction that does require a planning board and then the re review and approval of fossil fuel free um, units. So that already is in place in the regulations. It wouldn't affect someone who, for example, has a single family home and wants to add another unit or wants to, has a two family house and wants to, and, and feels that they, um, their life um, situation has changed and they want to create another lot next to them um, with that reduced lot line. But given the fact they already have a two family, they can't do that without this sort of modification. It also, um, so that wouldn't trigger a planning board review for an existing two family. Um, or if there was a single family home um, on which a new unit were proposed that was less than 2000 square feet. And if you, anybody has specific questions about other comments, I'd be happy to um, respond to those as well. Yeah, counselors, questions for Carolyn? Yeah. Thank you. So, Carolyn, that um, when I'm reading this, um, the you know the the language change here, and basically, it, it's making me think. So, this was the the original intention of zero lot line was to allow for two two uh, structures with a shared wall and. Is that what this language is reinstating that are just making clearer? 
Uh, originally, um, the intention for zero lot line was generated, you know, 30, 25, 30 years ago to um, allow a situation where you could draw a lot of parcel boundary down um, a side by side townhouse right. unit, let's say. Right and have separate parts, as long as there were 50 feet of frontage for each of those um, new parcel boundaries that you're drawing, or a situation in which um, in a cluster setting, which is um, you know, a different scenario, you could have um, a layout of lots where each structure was right on the lot line, but then the next structure wasn't until the opposite side that's a different scenario. So there are a couple of different ways that this was originally designed, but it was also, I mean, at the same time, it was also created to allow more flexibility um, of that separation. If you as the property owner were creating that new side lot line and um, there were, you know, tree requirements, in some cases, fence requirements and other components that were required to um, fill in sort of that narrower gap. Um, so that it really was a variety, creating a variety of ways that you could establish a new property um, carved off from an existing lot that already had a structure on it. But these are, but this is just to be, so I'm understanding this. So um, it's it's talking about a shared roof structure. So I'm picturing like a, a side by side two family, or it could be a series, you know, like you were mentioning a cluster and that. Um, and so it, I the way I, I so what I'm seeing here is that this is what was intended originally in zero lot line. It, it, am I reading that wrong? Are we doing something different or new here? Or are we just kind of restating and clarifying what the original intention was? I mean, I think the original intention was, uh, and it was specified as a single family home, but there was another provision so that you could do this with single family homes. However, there was another provision in the code that said you could add an accessory dwelling to a single family home and it would still be considered a single family home. So, you know, putting the two together, you could create a single family home with accessory dwelling um, as what previously was referred to as a zero lot line, now is referred to as reduced side setback lot line. Um, so, in, so yes, um, this is um, clarifying what was previously allowed and understood to be allowed. And yes, it, it is true that accessory dwelling was restricted to 800 square feet. Um, but I think that um, the, you know, changing that to a two family, which eliminates the re, um, restriction on, you know, the 800 square foot maximum um, is still principally two units under one roof. So it, it's comparable to that. The other thing I would say is, again, if you're building brand new, a new structure that is more than 2000 square feet, so each unit might be more than 800 square feet, um, that is going to trigger planning board review. So then there is a site plan review process that uh, evaluates any of the other issues that might arise. And it also brings with it that requirement to be fossil fuel free for both units. Um, so in that way, it's a little bit different than what it had been under zero lot line, but essentially, principally, it's the same concept of allowing two units on under this reduced lot line. Thank you. Marissa. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Carolyn, I, I'm just, uh, I'm trying to recall and I'm wondering if I'm recalling correctly. I recall that um, when the zero lot line um, was being discussed, I, I, am I recalling correctly that Habitat for Humanity and in particular those who are looking to make affordable housing, that there are real issues with having, um, having sort of multifamily condoized um, as opposed to zero lot line um, individual ownership for a, a basically shared wall structures. Am I recalling that correctly? 
Yeah, so that actually was a request, essentially um, going way back, a request by Habitat for Humanity to allow um, separate lot lines for structures that had shared party walls to create um, separation of ownership and reduce the conflicts that might arise between two different owners that are coming together um, and not having to share one parcel um, together but have individual property rights on separate parcels so that that was initially the impetus for creating this um, provision was um, to address a concern by Habitat for Humanity. Any other questions? And of course just to clarify that um, you know we can't set up rules based on what kind of housing someone's building. Um, that if we're creating the zoning mechanism that, um, you know, it applies for that type of structure, not the nonprofit or for profit or homeowner that's proposing it. Stan. Thank you. Um, so Carolyn, I'm just trying to unpack here both exactly what it is that we're being asked to vote on tonight and the motivation for it. You, you, you describe you were you got me there you go Stan thank go you ahead. thank you um currently this um uh, reduced lot line use for two units under a single roof structure is now triggering a what a site plan review no actually currently because we modified the definition of accessory dwelling and we call it anything that's a second unit on a property it's no longer single family with accessory it's just a two unit and so effectively there isn't an allowance at all to have a reduced lot line in a scenario where there's a second unit, you know, even if it's 500 square feet, even if it's 600, whatever the size is, you can't do that anymore. And so this so, would allow, this would reintroduce that ability. So there's currently no allowance for this uh, okay. under any permitting process. In fact, it would have to be a, a variance issued by the zoning board. Right. Okay, okay. So my understanding from what you listed uh, a few minutes ago is that this would apply to a current owner of a single family home uh, who wanted to add a unit up to 2000 square feet. So the one of the key components is increasing that dimension, that limit from 800 square feet to 2000 square feet. Is that, is that correct on the second um, unit? Yeah, so under 2,000 square feet means it, you don't have to go to the planning board for review. You can add a unit without triggering the two-family review by the planning board. And, and the limit used to be under the accessory dwelling 800 square feet. Right. Right, right. Okay, so can you speak a bit to the your your sense of why increasing that limit from 800 to 2000 uh, is desirable? Um, yeah, I, the, and, and I just wanna be clear, it's not about trying to allow bigger units per se, it's just that we now allow um, additional units without sort of a definition of what size they can be. So really the reason why I think this is beneficial is because um, second unit, you know, I think the issue really is if the units are under one roof structure as opposed to detached or connected with a long, you know, breezeway to create a second unit, those um, are much more like sort of the um, um, single family with accessory dwellings that, you know, from the street, you might not even know that there are two units in there. Um, 
And I think it, it's not so much that I think it's a good thing to increase it from 800 to 2000. It's just because we made those changes to two units previously, I mean, from accessory to just sort of um, generalizing two units that um, this is no longer an option for people um, to create or carve off a second parcel next to them um, to allow for, you know, a source of income or um, or housing for someone who might need another house. So you see it as increasing flexibility for, um, uh, for relatively modest uh, size housing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, single and two family units are definitely low density housing and, you know, are, are just, um, you know, provide those options that people prefer to have in that, in that context. And it does create a, a more flexibility. Thank you. Marissa. Um, yeah, I was also um, wondering, um, I know that part of the advantages uh, when we pass two family um, by right, and then also in discussions, it seems to me, that, and also in the community resources discussions that, that we had, that um, uh, I recall learning that um, basically shared wall dwelling um, are for a lot of reasons, more energy sufficient and sustainable um, for a lot of reasons. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and, um, and remind me of, of maybe what I've heard in, in other meetings? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of conversation about sort of uh, on a continuum, the least energy efficient units, no matter whether you build to net zero or, um, or the, um, or you have solar or whatever you have on your property, a single family detached home is sort of on the least energy efficient spectrum. And the more units you have under a roof, the greater um, energy efficiency you achieve essentially. So if you have two units under one roof, then you've got two families essentially in a shared party wall. It's more both more efficient from a land use standpoint, but also you can achieve better efficiencies together with those units as opposed to being sort of more on a land extensive um, pattern of a single family detached home. Any other questions from counselors? Okay, um, see a few people have their hands up, so we'll do a second round. And uh, we did end up going, uh, some folks took seven minutes the first time and just in the interest of time, I would like folks to uh, stick to three minutes um, for this, this second round. And first up is Jackie Balance. Yes. Welcome back, Jackie. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with two family, multi-family houses, two family, three family, four family. I, I, I shared walls is a great energy saver. The problem with zero lot line by right comes when we have 50 foot frontage. We had this conversation two years ago with the reduced slot line, changing zero lot line to reduced line didn't make it better. With a reduced slot line, you can actually get a 35 foot wide house on a 50 foot frontage, depending on the circumstances. We don't have to go through that again. The problem is zero lot line with by right with 50 foot frontage is <laughs> The problem, uh, zero lot line. If you've got a hundred foot frontage, the setbacks are no problem. This is a problem. Zero lot line by right. As long as we've got fifty foot front frontage, we're going to have more and more of these things that have disturbed our neighborhoods, and um, that's all for now. Thank you. I have more thoughts, but I can't gather them. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, next is Deborah. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I have a few questions uh, and they can be taken in, in any order for uh, Director Mish. Um, one is that each time I'm in these meetings, I'm hearing about um, local residents, homeowners who want income flexibility or flexibility to you know, have a family on their whatever. 
So I'd like to know um, if the planning department would provide an inventory to the public and to um, all members of city boards of how the zero lot line uh, development has been used. Maybe we could say over the last five years to outline the projects because um, what I'm seeing is not what's being described very benignly in these meetings. So I'd like to know if uh, the planning department would would uh, do that so that everybody could have accurate information about what's actually happening versus what the, um, you know, the, I don't know, I want to say fantasy of what could happen. Um, I also want to know, I'd like an answer to um, something that's going to have, you know, yet more significant change. Um, there seems to be a conflict of interest in terms of uh, the planning office being over so many different um you know, historic preservation and land use and all the rest of it. So I have a question about um, why not wait on this particular change? Cause these are getting, these keep getting pushed forward quite quickly um, until after the historic preservation plan has been uh, designed and adopted. So I'd like to know what the rush is and whether or not we could wait until after that happens. Um, and the um, third thing, which, oh, I want to know whether or not the planning department has um, done any kind of study or would be willing to do a study since there's often talk of energy efficiency. Today we heard about uh, shared walls and stuff. Um, the relative energy efficiency of the kind of development that's being um, supported uh, compared to the loss of trees and also the carbon footprint of the kind of construction that's happening because um, from the research I've done, there's no evidence showing that there's any advantage to the kind of development that the city is encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next, Joyce Rosenthal. Um, yes, um, I I'm, as usual, a little bit confused because I hear this being spoken of by you, Carolyn, as a property owner with a house wanting to add uh, something else. I don't hear this being talked about as a developer coming in or a new uh, uh, structure being built. Um, so it seems like there are two different, I don't know, philosophies perhaps of how we're talking about this. Um, so that's something that's confusing to me because I hear about the property owner adding onto his property and it doesn't discuss the new uh, buildings that are being built. Thank you. And, Thank and you. I'm also and very interested to know if everybody understands this. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. Um, and we're going to take questions and also Deborah's questions and then answer them after everyone's had a chance to speak. So thank you for that question. Next is Jacqueline. Hi, thank you again for, for giving me the chance to speak. So yeah, I would I would voice the same concerns um, about, you know, homeowners versus speculative home buyers versus developers. I don't think that um, Oftentimes, homeowners are are creating uproars in the neighborhoods. It's speculative home buyers um, and and developers. Uh, I was at a planning board meeting. I think it was earlier this month where Habitat Humanity, if I'm not mistaken, was before the board um, talking about some. Um, new homes that were gonna be going up. Uh, I don't know if it's Glendale Road or where exactly um, they're planning on being built, but there were several trees that were old that were going to be coming down um, along the road that were not public uh, shade trees. So they didn't have to be replaced. I know Habitat for Humanity was willing to plant, I believe six trees. Um, to replace the ones being felled because they weren't in the greatest health. And um, Megan McDonough was thinking, okay, um, or I don't know if it's the Valley CDC or, or Habitat, but whatever it was, they were willing to, um, you know, replace some of those older trees that were going to get 
taken down in the front of the homes. And then in the back of the homes, um, these were examples of trees that were going to be crowned. Their tops were going to be cut off um, so that new solar installations would not get shaded. And I just really think that, um, you know, renewable energy technology is awesome and we need it. Uh, but as I've been saying, and as uh, forest experts have been saying, healthy, mature trees between the ages of 35 and 200 do supply our carbon sequestration, our oxygen production, wildlife habitat, and all these other um, benefits like cooling and flood reduction. And so if you're taking down trees like this all adds up, right? URB is you know, moderate size lots, moderate density areas, zones in our city. And if this is widespread and all these trees are being taken down, that really does begin to add up. And I'm not sure that the trade-off for adding new solar panels is worth it. And I think that's something that the planning board um, really needs to consider as well as, you know, every member of every board and commission and committee in in the city government. Um, these trees are providing us with the ability to survive. And so, um, you know, solar needs to go on land that's not been disturbed and, you know, leave alone the living, breathing beings that are, are giving us our ability to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. And the last person with their hand up is Claudia Lefko. Thanks again. I just have a couple comments. Um, one is about this owner uh, occupied house or as opposed to property. And it seems like we're developing policies that have to do with property when the truth is, you know, the it's it's a it's a person who's going to make a profit off of it. And maybe the owner would make a profit by putting a second building on their property. But it's it's not clear why we can't distinguish, make some sort of um, policy that, that admits that if it's an owner, uh, if the person is in a house on a property, that that's very different than, than some developer coming in um, and they're going, they don't, they're not going to live in those buildings. That's one thing. And the other thing that no one has talked about is really the, the you, you know, we're, we're under a lot of assumptions here that an old house, you know, with two people in it is not energy efficient. Yet I live in a 1000 square foot house with one other person. And when we get our energy assessment, we're using 67% less energy than the next person you know, the next house in the neighborhood. When we used to get the electric bills or whatever, we're always like, not to brag about this, but we always use the least in the neighborhood. So part of this has to do with not what size the house is necessarily. It, it, it has to do with what are the habits of the people in the house. And we have a house, the house that was knocked down in our neighborhood, 107 William Street, 10 children grew up in that house. When in the days when people had bigger families, now people aren't having big families anymore, but there is another house in the neighborhood where there are three generations living together, a couple of sisters and their children and grandparents. People are needing to live in all sorts of configurations. It's not just some couple, an old couple in a nice big house and whatever their energy is. I mean, there are so many things that are going to impact what the ultimate what the ultimate impact of housing is, including people's personal responsibilities. And I wish people would just think about this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. All right, let's turn it back over to uh, Carolyn, if you would like to address some of those questions. I did write them down if, if you need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll probably need some help with that. I tried to write it down too. Um, I do want to just go, I'm not, I was merely providing examples of situations that have come up in the, in over the last 10, 15 years of, of people who wanted to create lots. And yes, they are sometimes existing homeowners who it's not necessarily for a family member, but they do need a source of income and they have had the benefit of owning their home and then want to um, 
obtained some other value out of that. That's certainly part of property ownership, which is why um, we've had this dichotomy of people who own and don't own and, and has how that's affected, you know, relationships and, and ability for people to have housing. So no matter who is building the, it doesn't, we're not going to be focused on who's doing and who's gaining um, on this. And I, I, so, you know, a property owner who wants to divide a lot to gain money for themselves, that's their own personal decision. We don't go into, you know, determining whether they're worthy of that or not. And yes, they may sell it to a developer um, or someone who is moving or someone who needs new housing because the housing they're in isn't the right fit for them. And we wanna make sure we're providing those opportunities no matter who's doing it. And I will say that builders and developers are the people building homes for people. And we need to make sure that we're continuing to build homes to address our housing crisis. So um, I did give examples of people who have existing homes that wanna carve off land. Um, that's typically what happens. I mean, in every one of these situations on 170 Federal Street, the homeowner sold the parcel to someone who then could create more housing for other people who were in Northampton or moving to Northampton. Um, so it's important to remember that um, we, we don't and we can't um, and it's not appropriate to restrict and define who's allowed to build houses in Northampton. Um, and um, I think, you know, we haven't done evaluation on, you know, one for one about what's more effective in terms of, um, per, you know, building in town um, and cutting trees. We look at the bigger picture and say, we know that we have a housing crisis in the Valley. We have a housing crisis in Northampton. And by building close in, even if you're taking one tree down, it's far more efficient and um, a, um, better for our overall footprint instead of pushing that housing outward forcing people to drive for every single trip they need to make, creating more roads um, further out to access those units. So we're looking at it sort of at a bigger scale, not right down neighborhood by neighborhood and whether one tree um, cuts is cut for solar access for someone or for a house for someone, but we need to accomplish all of these things. And we also, that's why we also have an aggressive tree replacement requirement for when um, projects go through the planning board that there is tree replacement. And sort of going back to that 278 Birds Pit Road example that Jackie McCreena brought up, um, Habitat wanted to cut those trees for solar. They're, they're not crowning them, they're cutting every single tree in the back because they want easy solar access for those units that are gonna be net zero. Um, they are typically required, any applicant is typically required to replace trees. Um, under in accordance with the formula, even if they're cutting for solar access, except we do have a provision that allows for the development of affordable housing, sort of that trade off. We know there's a good that we want to encourage or not um, create too much burden upon. And so, because they're building 100% affordable housing units there with um, solar, they will not need to plant, uh, replant trees in accordance with the replacement requirement. However, the planning board did say you need to plant at least six trees, and they agreed to, to do the six trees on the street side. Um, and I think there was a question about um waiting for the historic preservation plan to be adopted historic preservation planning is very different from um is, is on a separate track the the um idea is to identify our resources identify how we can evaluate what those historic resources are and plan for their protection um the land the zoning piece um won't be in conflict with that. Um, and we don't need to hold off all zoning waiting for the historic preservation plan because that's sort of a, um, a different um, lens um, and evaluation of those historic resources. Um, then there was a question about looking at, I think the reduced lot line um, 
properties or projects that have happened over the last five years, we could probably do run that. Um, I'd have to pull the building, ask the building department to help out on there and pull out um, those um, figures. But we certainly could take a look at that um, if anybody's interested in the information about the total number of units that have been created under this provision. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, um, that, that would be useful information. I think getting data like that uh, is, is helpful. Um, and um, I think you hit on all the questions I had written down. Um, are there other uh, questions from counselors before we consider closing the public hearing? Okay, seeing none, uh, looking for a motion to close the public hearing. Move, we close the public hearing. Second. Uh, motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Marissa Elkins. Any discussion on that closure? Roll call, please. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Jim, I think Councilor. you're muted. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Well, motion passes unanimously. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, now is our time to deliberate and we can still ask questions of staff as well if we do have clarifying questions. Councillors. Well, I, I do like to give, you know, as the chair, I like to give the option for others, but uh, I am happy to go first if folks would, would like. Um, so, um, yeah, so thank you everyone for, for speaking, raising those concerns. Um, first, I think, and Carolyn spoke to this, we, we, we did modify the zero lot line to the reduced lot line back in 2021, and that was, was to address the concerns about uh, the distance between houses. And um, so now that's limited to 20, they must be 20 feet apart in URB and 10 feet apart in URC. Um, and that matches the historical development patterns of the neighborhoods. You know, URB, for example, has many examples of houses closer than 30 feet apart, but it's much less common that to have less than 20 feet. Um, so I think, I think it has made an, a more appropriate and, and um, so that's one way in which we've already addressed some of the issues with it and then um, you know I think we need housing of all types but multifamily housing is especially in need if it provides the benefits um, you know energy savings a lower cost per unit and um, it's very likely as Carolyn said that the thresholds will be met for our fossil free fossil fuel free energy requirements. Um, and yeah, the general, you know, I'll, the data that I see have found on, on climate concerns is that uh, living closer together is much greener than living spaced apart. Um, I've written about it in my newsletter and shown uh, a bunch of data about that. And I'd be happy to talk with anyone uh, about that issue. Um, and also, just the realization that uh, as the, one of the drivers of the housing crisis is the demographic shifts where people are living in smaller family sizes. And that um, that means that we need more units um, and those may we, it would, and many of those units will be smaller because uh, the, the family sizes are smaller. So this allows for um, this allowment allowing for two families um, makes a lot of sense because if, if folks are going to be developing, I would rather have them be developing more multifamilies and us getting more units than developing single families. And although single families are certainly needed as well. Um, so I, I um, do think this, this is the kind of development that, that we want to encourage. Um, 
I, you know, someone spoke to the, the pros and, and cons. I mean, everything we do is, is a balancing act. Um, we are trying to meet certain goals here and then trying to discourage other goals here. We have limited control because zoning can only do so much. Um, it, it basically, it zoning stops certain things, uh, but it, it can only allow uh, if it doesn't require that anything get built. Um, so if we were to have too much of a restricted zoning, we're just not going to get development at all. And um, for some, that, that would be a positive outcome. But when we look at our, our goals around where we want housing to be built, I think that uh, that, would, that, that is not uh, where we want to go. So we have to make rules that balance the different needs of, of, of tree protection and historic preservation and the need for housing. Um, so I, I am in favor of, of this uh, change. Marissa. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I, I had to, um, I would like to echo, uh, I'm glad you went first. I would echo a lot of, of what you, you said. Um, I am, um, uh, I am thoroughly persuaded um, by the science uh, and by the um, sort of planning policies that say that we need to, that in order to balance our um, environmental and sustainability, goals with um, our desperate need for housing in the city that we, you know, that we're, we have to make some choices. Um, and that, um, and that, you know, what we are trying to do with this ordinance and with um, a, a number of other things that have passed over the course of, I don't know, three May oral administrations and I don't know, eight or eight, nine, 10 city councils, uh, that what we're, what we're trying to do is to balance that. Um, I am, I, I do not hear um, um, the, um, I am, I do not see that the science matches um, the claims um, that, uh, that the, 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 the building of these houses relative to the, the tree loss relative to our overall city conservation goals and the city, like just today, um, the city uh, announced that there was an acquisition of another piece of, of uh, enormous Greenland, um, you know, outside of this. It is that balancing. Um, and, um, and there is no, um, honestly, if, if, if the city of Northampton never approved another cluster development that called for new infrastructure and new roads and new sewers um, and more sprawl, um, I, I would be very happy with that. Um, I think that would be very consistent with our, our goals. Um, and so that means that if the city is going to accommodate everybody who wants to live here now and in the future and have the variety of housing types that we need, um, that we need to be thinking creative, creatively and we need to be, be forward thinking. Um, and I, I don't think entrenching um, the existing um, limitations that uh, traditional zoning has put in place um, achieves that. Um, and I, I do want to, I also want to comment, I, I have heard the refrain several times now of we're not heard, we're ignored. Um, I, you are, you're here. You had notice of this hearing. You had notice of this amendment. You're here. We hear you. Um, disagreement with is not um, ignoring. Um, I, you know, I was, I stood for election and I what didn't hide the ball about what my issues were, my priorities were, and, and frankly, housing and, and, and a sustainable and smart um, balancing of those priorities as we do that was part of that. But if there's a groundswell of folks out there who, who want it, who see it differently, then, then, you know, by all means, um, you know, please, please, you know, pursue that path and, and see if enough of your fellow Northampton residents agree with you and want to see you put those changes in place and, and, and stand for office. Um, but um, uh, but it, I, the, the time that it's taken for all of us to be here and to be sit through comments and to read the emails that we receive and to have our city um, department heads be here um, uh, 
to hear and listen and take your perspectives into consideration. Um, uh, it is, it's a little bit frustrating to hear that constantly um, described as ignoring and not listening and undemocratic. Um, it's kind of exactly the Nobody opposite. said that. No, no, Nobody no. People said that. People definitely did. Sorry. Um, we can't didn't. Uh, hear from the public any further because the public meeting has been closed. So, so, uh, and public so, hearing. and that's, Sorry. thanks, Alex. So, um, and so I, you know, I just have to raise that because it's, it's a, it's a common refrain. Um, but with that said, I um, favor this legislation. I would approve it. Um, I would give it a, or give it a positive recommendation and uh, believe it is consistent. There's already mosquitoes out. That's sad. Um, I would give it, um, I believe it's consistent with our environmental, uh, with our goals for sustainability and resilience and um, our goals for um, housing um, and increasing the housing stock and flexibility for existing property owners. So I am supportive of this legislation. Thank you, Marissa. Stan. Thank you. Um, and thanks both to uh, Alex and Marissa for your uh, earlier comments. Um, it is, as you said, a balancing act uh, in terms of, of considering uh, our goals for increased housing and our climate crisis uh, response, uh, among other things. And uh, I think that um, we, we, need to, we need to correct uh, a situation that, uh, that, that exists uh, and, and that we're being asked to address, and that is uh, the, the need to uh, allow property owners uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, add an additional unit, which we used to call an accessory dwelling unit, or to divide their, their property, to take equity out of the, uh, the property that they, they own. And um, I guess my, uh, my thought is that uh, we should restore this uh, 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 to the single, to the category of single family by right, which, which has existed. Uh, and I would, I would be interested, uh, I, I echo uh, Alex's interest in the, the five-year study that was, that was uh, suggested of looking at reduced lot line the impact of reduced lot line, and I would, would would be particularly interested in seeing what the size of those houses uh, are, the dwellings that have resulted from the use of reduced lot line over the past five years. And uh, I mean, I'd be willing to consider uh, a smaller uh, uh, limit. Right now, we're we're looking at uh, two thousand square feet, but if that if, if there's evidence that supports that as a reasonable uh, size for a, a second unit, as opposed to the old uh, 800 square foot standard, then uh, I, will, I will accept that. But I would, so I would, I would ask particularly Carolyn that that, that, that be part of the, the study. Um, so at this point, with, with, the, with the proviso that I would like to see uh, that, uh, that, that data before the city council votes, uh, on this, um, I too will will support sending it forward with a with a positive recommendation. Um, I would clarify. I think there might have been some confusion about the two thousand square foot number. That is the threshold of new construction that requires site plan approval, um, and therefore all of the things that go with that, including fossil fuel free. Um, it is in URB and URC. We don't have. Do we have any limits on the size of multifamily dwellings under one roof? No. Okay. No. Uh, yeah, Stan. Well, Alex, that was what I was referring to, that, that that triggers something more than just by right. It triggers a, a site plan review, which right. is more, a more rigorous process. Yes. Yes, so so that I, I I wasn't I wasn't referring to limiting the size. I was simply referring to the threshold for a site plan review. Right. Thank you. And in in entirely new construction, you know that, that it's the sum total 
of the new construction. So when, when you're, if you're building two units in new construction, it's, it's pretty likely that, that and, but not necessarily, there could be small, you know, you could be, have sub 1000 foot, um, but, but many would, would be likely to, to achieve, to be over that. Yes, correct. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so a few thoughts here. Uh, first of all, um, I appreciated what Carolyn was sharing about um, uh, making that distinction between the owner and the developer. That we really can't do that, and that um, that uh, that yet I. It's, it's just not a place we can go. And I, I know it's a concern and whether somebody owns a house and adds on to it or somebody purchases it and develops it for resale at some point, we can't go and make that distinction within our rules. And so that's just the way it is with property in, you know, in our country. Um, um, Alex, I really appreciated what you were saying around uh, that we have these goals that are part of a balancing act, and that um, that um, and but at some point you have to make a choice, and sometimes you're you're losing uh, some some canopy so you can get solar, that you're use, losing some open space so you can create more housing. That all of these 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 pressures are acting upon each other. And there's no situation where you can infinitely fold all of these goals into the same space. And so, um, and that when the choices are made, th they can be hard for folks as, you know, as some of the, um, the um, slides earlier uh, shared. Um, to uh, to uh, Marissa, I, you know, I, I agree with the idea that if people are really um, feeling strongly about this, that there's elections coming up and they should think about running and see if there's enough interest in this um, that um, that we are listening. And, and I'm, I'm gonna say that I, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm not hearing 50, 100 people. I'm, I'm hearing, you know, a, a, a group of people who have the same concerns and that, um, and, um, and I am listening. Um, and the, the last thing I wanna say is that, you know, in, basically in my view that this, this what, what's being requested here is to, um, it, it, it's, it's an alignment with the original intentions of zero lot line and, um, and matches what, uh, what we now call uh, reduced lot line. And so I, I, I'm, I'm fine with this moving forward with a positive recommendation. Thank so you, I'll Jeff. make a motion mm. to send this forward to council with a positive recommendation. Do I hear a second? Second. A motion made by Jim Nash and seconded by Stan Moulton. Uh, I'll add a little bit to the, the discussion, uh, which is, yes, we can't discriminate in zoning, but we can look at the results and we can look at the, the history of what's happened and then what may happen in the future and, and tweak things in a way that, that may try to achieve different goals. Um, so I am curious to see what the history has been uh, in relation to, to you know, how many uh, home homeowners split off a lot and sold it versus how many plots of raw land were developed into multiple um, or, or demolitions as well. Um, but um, any other discussion on the uh, motion, motion for a positive recommendation to city council? Jim. Well, it, along that line, I just wanted to clarify that some of the slides that were shared earlier um, that um, didn't, so there was a, the, the property on 107 William Street is, is not a zero lot line or a reduced lot line development. The backyard ADU in Florence also 
is not a reduced lot, lot line development. That um, just to be clear that yes, there are the there those uh, uh, homes that were built in Bay State. We've changed the zoning around, you know, to um, you know to the reduced lot line, but that um, it, it's just. I think the report will be help, uh, helpful in terms of making it clear as to what actual reduced lot line, zero lot line development looks like. Um, so, thank you. Thank you, Jim. I didn't realize that we had lost Marissa there for a bit, but- um, Really? She, yes, Marissa is back. Uh, although it doesn't have audio yet. So we'll just give her a minute to uh, reconnect and uh, hopefully and rejoin us for any further discussion or and the vote. Melissa, are you able to connect to audio? Well, you wouldn't hear me if <laughs> if you can't. Uh, Hmm. hmm. Okay. There we go. Let's, uh... Where'd she go? What? Hmm. Let's give there, it she there she is. There she is. Uh oh. <laughs> We can't hear you. Maybe Sorry. try turning off your video. Hey, my device, uh, my device, this car. My apologies. How about now? No. Uh, yeah, we're. I could hear the last few things. Maybe try turning off your video because it sounds like it's a bandwidth issue. And can you hear, can, could you try talking now? <laughs> Technical problems. <laughs> All right, I think I'm back. Okay. Great. So a motion is on the floor Sorry for a that. positive recommendation. And we are asking for any, uh, if there's any further discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. That motion passes unanimously for a positive recommendation and will be taken up this Thursday at our city council meeting. Okay, thanks everyone. We have two more items. Um, next is 23.278, an ordinance to reclassify parking meter zones on Elm Street. This was referred by the city council on March 30th. And uh, Carolyn, are you here to speak to this as well? Um, I can speak to this, um, even though I'm not the parking expert. I just want you to know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is so. Remember, we've um, you all passed um, uh, many changes to the restructuring of the parking management system to try to affect um, better outcomes for turnover in downtown, and. Um, even though we had run it through the parking um, division after this was adopted, they went through with a fine tooth comb and found some um, adjustments that needed to be made. So that's what this is really just cleaning that up um, and, and making sure that these um, are consistent. So um, let me just open up the, um, I think uh, the first one you said was um, Elm Street. So. That's really, um, as you can see, it's it's um, making those classes um, that are out Elm Street um, um, consistent with what was previously adopted, and so it's really just cleaning up. Both of these are sort of are cleanups and clarifications of what the council already adopted. And with, oh uh, yeah, Jim. 
Yeah, just uh, so so Carolyn, this was part of there was a package like a plan we approved and uh, around parking changes. So this Elm Street piece was part of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's been through the TPC. It's been approved by council. This is really about cleaning it up and implementing it. Yeah, so these were just sort of left out in the first review, but it was intended to be all there. And it was just sort of when picking really in fine detail, um, they discovered that these were uh, left out. Well, I also recall we were taking an incremental approach on some of this too, that like there was a number of, uh, we made changes around Smith and um, that that there was a rollout part of it as well. So, but I'm, I'm gratified to know that it's part of that original package plan that we approved. Okay. Yeah. Um, B, I have a technical question. Is it intentional to remove the words class and and? Um, because right as it's written, it looks like it will just say the two different types. Um, maybe we could bring those up. It will just say 3D for it. Um, yeah. And it, so Under the, words, the column class, of time and class. And, what's that? Yeah. So it's under that column time class. So it would just be 3D for a. Okay. Um, any other questions, Stan? Yeah, as, I, as I'm reading those uh, those classes, what we're doing is is we're moving back by uh, one hour, the start of the enforcement from uh, from nine to ten, and uh, nine a.m. to ten a.m. and uh, it's only enforced uh, now until. I guess 5 p.m. Uh, under class 3D. So we're right. just changing, we're just, we're slightly changing the hours of enforcement. Yeah. And the price is 50 cents rather than 25 cents. Yes. Yes. Any other questions from counselors? Any members of the public who wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, um, we're looking for a recommendation. Move a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. Um, made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Jim Nash. Any discussion on a positive recommendation? Roll call, please. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Great, that passes unanimously with a positive recommendation and we will take that up on Thursday. Uh, next is 23.279, an ordinance to clarify parking garage time limits. And uh, again, uh, Carolyn, would you like to speak to this? Um, sure. So, um, this is, um, just to clarify, there wasn't a, the, the, the Gothic street parking garage wasn't, um, included in that original text. Um, I guess, again, sort of another error that was found by the, by the parking folks when they were going through this and, and cleaning up. Any questions? Any members of the public who wish to speak to this item? All right, seeing none, um, I'm going to take a motion. I uh, move, move. Uh, to forward with positive recommendation. Second. The motion made by Marissa Elkins and Seconded by Stan Moulton. Any discussion on that positive recommendation? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. 
So that passes unanimously and we will take that up as well on uh, Thursday. Um, so that's the last of our business. I just wanted to make um, an announcement that I would appreciate hearing from members of the committee about hybrid versus remote meetings. My thinking has been that when we have a longer topic to deal with and our scheduling allows that um, we could consider a hybrid meeting. Um, I don't wanna have a discussion about it now since it's not on the agenda, but please let me, Laura, uh, know your thoughts on this. Thank you. I'd move to adjourn in, on that note. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Were you inviting that conversation now or did you want no. to hear from us? Okay, no, right. I, I would sorry. like to hear from you outside of the meeting. Uh, I think you said second. that and my mind uh, wandered for just a split second. I apologize. No worries. Looking for a second on that adjournment. Second. Okay, motion made by Marissa Elk and seconded by Stan Moulton. Roll call, please, on the journey. Um, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. And yes. We are, oh, sorry. We are adjourned.